So graduate of Glasgow School of Art, uh, Alan, and uh, you enigmatically describe your practice as exploring the semiotics of urban spaces. Yep. So run us through your presentation and tell us about that. Thanks, Malcolm. Yeah, I'll just put it up now. So as Malcolm said there, I graduated from GSA Fine Art Photography this year and was chosen for Future Proof. What I'm going to start off my talk by talking about a little bit is I'll show you my degree show. So there's nine images in the degree show, but six of them were chosen for Future Proof. So it's a slightly different installation in Future Proof if you've seen it, if you've been to Irvin. But if you look at the nine images here, you'll see that they're all thematically similar. They all look at semiotics around us and behavior modification. Something that's here that's not in Future Proof is if you look at the image on the right, there's a CCTV or a webcam, which was streaming all of my uh, degree show the whole time. And as it did that, people could log in and watch it. And because of part of my uh, um, degree show was also about surveillance theory. So not only about the semiotics, but also about semiotics which relate back to surveillance, because often we'll see signs which say you're being watched. And I thought it was interesting to give people the chance to be the watcher. So you won't see that so much in the Future Proof show because that's not there. But I think that's really interesting in bridging this thing about we give up all of our data all of the time. And what does that mean in the society to still be watched? And how does that modify our behavior? Because that's the main part of why I look at semiotics. I'm interested in what it does to us in terms of behavior modification, what it means for people that own land and space and why they try and control it. And I think through my photography, what I want to do is get people to question that, to look around them and say, oh, I see these signs every day, but I have a habitual way of viewing them and I don't even notice them. And I realized that quite early on in my life that actually, I have been looking at these things, or I mean, my life as a photographer, I've been looking at these signs all the time, but I just ignore them. And when I started photographing, it really started off with no parking signs, but we'll come on to that later on. So this was another part of my degree show that you won't necessarily see at Future Proof. So what I do is I make signs. One of them's there. This is no through road on it. And I there were six of them all together. And I make these signs and I go out and have what I would call public performances or CCTV interventions. And what I chose was, four different locations which had live webcams that were streaming 24 hours a day that anybody could log into. So they're not password protected. Often they're there for maybe tourism reasons. So it was a way for people to be able to look at them and then think, oh, maybe I want to go there. And um, the one in Lanark is a quite interesting one. It gets logged in quite a lot by people just to have a look at Lanark and see what's going on and from people all over the world. So there was Lanark, Loch Marlick, Linlithgow and Inverness. And in all of them, I took about two hours to do this. And I had a backup team, actually someone else who's on this right now, Nico, helped me a lot by helping to screen record while I was out there changing the signs over in the two hours I did the performances. And what I wanted to do by this was allow anybody who logs on to see me, but also to have this interaction where I make people question and challenge the CCTV. And the signs were all from pictures I'd taken and they came through that and through things that I'd seen and ideas that came up throughout the work. And I want people to think, actually they become a little bit nonsensical in some way, like no through road, in front of a CCTV camera doesn't make 100% sense, but it talks about the no through road signs that you'll see. And it questions how they modify your behavior or how you interact with them. And it also on top of that questions the CCTV or the watching, and that allows them also to be the watcher as I talked about earlier on. These were just four uh, quick screenshots. You can see me in Linlithgow and Loch Marlick on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, it's Lanark and Inverness on the bottom. You can see a funny thing happening, but you can maybe ask me more about what's going on in the Inverness one if you want to later on, but because of time, I'll move on. This was one um, of the no parking images. So they kind of break down into three different sections, which is no parking, surveillance theory or CCTV, and what I call warning signs. But for me, a warning sign is anything that isn't saying you can't park there or be there, but it warns you not to be there for some reason. And it's another way to modify your behavior in that sense. This image I really love because this is the inside of the car park and you can only see that one sign from inside because if you look at the bottom, the actual other side has ripped off. So the, it doesn't work anymore really. Only people can know what time it's open till who are already inside the car park. So if you come there before that, you'd never find out. I also find the yes sticker in this picture really interesting because it's one of not many of my pictures which actually tell you where they are or give you an insight into where it might be because most of them other than the language of it being in English which gives you maybe five or six countries to choose from off the top of my head straight away you wouldn't necessarily know where they are 
And I think that's a really nice little harking back to also something that was a big time in Scotland, but also showing you that we're in Scotland. This is one of a CCTV, it was taken in Port Glasgow. I find it interesting because there's a CCTV sign and the camera, which you often don't see together. Often there's a sign and no camera or a camera and no sign. And I think that um, having both together is really interesting. I also think that aesthetically, it's quite an interesting picture. Often people say my work's similar to Lewis Baltz, but I feel I'm doing, I'm not doing what he's doing because he was looking at like industrial areas, but he was showing the beauty in them. He was saying, look, we're, these are overlooked areas and they actually have some form of beauty aesthetically, but I'm more wanting us to question the areas, like who's owning it or what it means and what do these signs mean for us? So it's, more like a Stephen Willits type of work, you know, looking at semiotics around us and semiology and questioning that. This one's really interesting because it has two signs in it, which I find funny. One that tells you there's security and guard dogs and one that invites you in. Um, anyone that maybe knows where this is, it's in the very west of Glasgow. The Barclay Colour Estate is there. There's a crane in the background, a crane that some people might also know. So I think if you know some things, you can work out where this is. But I think it's these contradictions of the two signs within the image that really drew me to this image and to pick it for my degree show and then later on for future proof. Um, this one's interesting. I'm going to be qu as quick as I can now because it kind of looks like a prison and you also can't really read the sign within the image. And I thought that that's interesting for people because when you see stuff, you often, you know, when I go out and take pictures, often you can't read the signs anymore. So they're still there and people leave them up, but they've lost, lost their function. And I, this is not a prison. Someone is just protecting the land inside here for having things inside it. I'll just tell you it was a scrapyard. So they obviously have scrap metal and things inside, which they want to protect from people trying to steal it. But it really feels like overkill in this in this sense for me. But you wouldn't really necessarily know that, but I'm interested in how far people are willing to go to protect that space. This one's interesting um, for me because of the map, you could walk into it very easily, yet there's a sign telling you not to. And actually nobody did while I was there. I often stay for like quite long periods of time when I'm at these places just to see what happens around them. And if people are actually engaging with the signs or if not, or if they're taking them in, you know, or if they're just flagrantly disagreeing with them or if they just don't even notice them and with this one no one people were obviously you like agreeing with it or like not testing it but you could easily if you wanted to and the final one I've got is another is a CCTV sign and um, the place in the background is not being used but it was still heavily controlled and heavily uh, protected but then there's only this tiny little warning CCTV sign and no camera I looked around for maybe half an hour and I couldn't find a camera anywhere so for me, it clearly shows that what they're trying to do is make you feel watched and make you act in a way that you would if you were being recorded, but not even doing that. And often I think, who does watch the cameras? You know, I saw another question I like to bring up. I think my work doesn't yet answer these questions, but I'm more interested in asking the questions to give the viewer of the work something to think about and promote ideas and then open up a conversation about what it means. And I'll leave it there. If anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to answer them at the end. And if we don't have time in this, feel free to contact me on Instagram or anything with any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. That's a fascinating um, presentation. Uh, I should say uh, to everyone that what you will see or what the artist will share with you tonight is something of a the tip of a, of a larger iceberg, right? And as Alan says, go to his website and you can explore much more. What's in Future Proof is just a small sample. But I think um, uh, if it's okay with the participants here, we'll change the order a little bit. So maybe um, could we ask you, Susan, to, to come on screen and give your presentation on your work? So we're moving from the, the industrial uh, areas that where you're under surveillance to to the abandoned places that's the feature of your work so take it away susan thanks malcolm uh, let me just see if i can share my screen first one second um so yes i graduated uh with a ba in professional photography from edinburgh college this year and this was the project that i did in my last year of that degree course. Uh, I specialise, um, as Malcolm said, in landscape photography. And this final project was, as it says, about abandoned places. And the idea from this was about finding places in Scotland, uh, primarily for ease of travel, uh, where the 
place itself may not have been the most beautiful, um, but it was set within beautiful landscapes. Two years ago, I did a, a course of um, a series of photographs which were more like your, your typical calendar pictures, um, lovely, beautiful landscapes. And this time I wanted to give myself a challenge where there was a juxtaposition of the ugly and the beautiful together. And I thought if I can find places that have been abandoned but are in beautiful landscapes, um, this would give me the chance to do that. I quite liked the quote that Ed Russia had. Um, I hope I've pronounced his surname correctly, but it was sometimes the ugliest things have the most potential. Um, and uh, this was um, part of the research that I did was to do with the new topographics. Um, and their work shows how man and environment interact uh, quite nicely. A lot of it is in black and white. This project was to be in colour and I wanted to also have a look at how to actually present a series of pictures in a portfolio that would all give the same kind of theme. So I was looking at artists such as Narav Kander and the project that he had here in China was to do with uh, the Yangtze River and it had lots of lovely yellow soft tones and regardless of what the subject matter was in the picture. It always gave out this beautiful, soft atmosphere. So that's what I aimed for in this project. Now I looked at several themes there to um, see where I could actually go and have a look at places. Um, so that include abandoned industries or railway lines in Scotland, quite a few branch lines that have closed, uh, abandoned military sites and airfields, um, some abandoned homesteads or clearance townships, and uh, abandoned projects. So places where um, maybe a project started or used to operate, but uh, has just been abandoned and everything's been left. And the first site that I looked at was the Bogside Explosives Factory in Irvine. And this was actually surprisingly difficult to find. It's um, in the middle of nowhere um, and hidden deep in the undergrowth. As you can see, this picture was shot uh, on a very cold day. It's minus four in January last year. And um, well, this year, I beg your pardon. And the, this was actually a very um, clear blue sky picture. So what I did was I used colour grading to give it that nice kind of soft yellow tone um, and just pulled the saturation down just a little bit um, to give it that effect. And it has, I hope, um, given the effect that the building actually stands out and the, the picture speaks to you, I think, a little bit more than the, the harsh um, blues and, and colours that uh, the, the the raw file had. Uh, on my way back, I did see this picture. Now, it's not strictly speaking um, an abandoned place. This is actually the new explosives factory, but it's looking over to the Isle of Arden, and I couldn't resist getting this picture. And I find even when I'm doing um, specific shots, uh, if I'm out and about in the countryside, um, if there's a beautiful picture, I will take it because I know it's going to come in handy for another project. But this is looking over to the Isle of Arran, which was covered in snow, lovely inversion layer on, on top of the Clyde there. The second place that I went to was, I was looking at the abandoned railway lines and I went down to Rickerton Junction, which uh, again is, is a bit of a, a trek to get in. It's in the middle of nowhere. There are no roads that go to it um, and it's south of Hoyick. Now, this place has got two uh, still standing uh, abandoned buildings, and this was one of the two, and it's the station master's house. And this afternoon, the sun was actually coming straight into the camera. So what I did with this was I put my thumb over the lens to stop the glare from coming in, and knowing that I would have to actually um, edit that out. So that's exactly what I did for this shot here. My third site, um, it was getting slightly warmer, so you can see there's no frost. And uh, this was Crail Airfield. Um, again, this is um, photographed quite a lot. Um, you see people who, particularly on abandoned sites, which um, are on the internet, they'll have typically have a Crail, Crail Airfield. And this particular building just stands in the middle of a field, which is now used for agriculture. You can see some black things at the back there. This is now a racetrack, um, and these were the tyres which they've stacked up um, for bumpers. Um, but this is the old um, runway here and the old building that uh, was associated with this airfield. This was an old uh, naval airfield. 
um, and has been completely abandoned, but the building is still in quite good condition. So that was a nice one to photograph. Um, another naval site was the Loch Long Torpedo Range, um, upside Archer. And this one, the weather was quite appalling, um, but this was taken in the half hour where it actually stopped raining. And it actually was really good for the mist coming through the trees and the hills. And so I got some nice layers of mist there in this shot. This building, um, we can see in the next shot here that I've got of it, there was rails that went into the building where I would imagine the torpedoes were taken in and out and then they were shot into the loch uh, for their test practice. And on the side of this building, there was actually some amazing graffiti, um, just this bit here. So I've called this picture of the raven because there was a, a beautiful um, artistic raven painted on the side. Hartwood Hospital was one of several hospitals. Um, I think they were Victorian uh, hospitals, but a lot of these ones have now gone to disrepair. Some are being converted, um, as we speak, into new properties. Uh, but Hartwood Hospital, this was actually used for the Batman movie. Um, it's got some very eerie looking towers there. Um, all the roof has fallen in and there's um, quite dangerous asbestos, which is why they've fenced it off. Um, but it just looks really quite abandoned and quite theatrical in the middle of the fields where the other buildings used to lie. And that impact on the environment um, is something, if you if you just stand and consider that picture and think about what used to be there, and think about how the environment is now also taking over that site. Um, now, the last image that I shot was up near Nairn, and this is Tarlair Pool. It's a, a swimming pool which was closed and it's, it's derelict now. And that white building was the changing rooms. They are actually beneficiaries of a heritage lottery grant. Um, and the renovation work began earlier this year. So that is now going to be converted into a cafe. So um, I was quite lucky to get this into my abandoned buildings project. Um, it is quite a spectacular um, location with the cliffs behind it and all the way around. And the little pool here at the front, you can just see a little wall, which was the beginner swimmer's pool, the baby's pool. I'm not quite sure why they put it quite so near to the rocks. Um, seems slightly dangerous to me, but uh, that's uh, it's very, very um, atmospheric. I actually met um, a man who was walking around uh, the pool here, who said that he'd learned to swim there and he was 82. So that perhaps gives you an idea of just how old this is. Um, so that was Tarlayer Pool. That was quite an interesting spot to find as well, hidden away. Most of these sites were actually uh, quite difficult to find. And uh, I used tools such as um, what three words uh, in some cases. It's a, a very useful tool to find things that uh, are not signposted but uh, are visible from the air. And that is the end of the, the show here. Um, I have, as Malcolm mentioned, other uh, photos on the website there. Um, so thank you very much. Over to you, Malcolm. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So um, I think uh, next, if I could ask um, uh, Rhys uh, to come on live now. We can go with you, uh, Rhys, then Karen, uh, then Hanin. Uh, if that's okay with folks. So we're now going to uh, focus in on uh, the locality of uh, where Rhys uh, worked. So take it away, Rhys. Um, so my name's Rhys Thompson. I am a, a documentary photographer and artist currently based in southwest of Scotland. Um, I started studying photography in two, 2018 uh, at Dumfries and Galloway College, um, and I worked my way up to the HND. Uh, I then had the opportunity, luckily, to then um, carry on that study into the University of Cumbria through a collaboration that uh, the college and the university had. Uh, then I had uh, graduated with a BA in photography this year. So um, first of all, I wanted to kind of start off showing a little bit of the context behind what led up to um, what I've sh shown at Future Proof. Um, <clears throat> So this work here was basically, we had this um, unit called Blue, Blueprint of Practice, where we had um, three projects to do that um, obviously um, you looked at the one theme, but um, you explored it in different methodologies. 
Um, I didn't want to stray away from analog because that's what I was interested in. Uh, so I kind of wanted to stick with um, like put myself. It was an opportunity for me to look at my identity, where I was from, um, you know, what connections I had at the time. Um, and it, in a way, it led me into thanking everybody who supported me through my, my degree. Um, so these long exposures, um, I wanted to do these um, to kind of reflect on the isolation I felt when I was young. Uh, my mum was off on a night shift and um, basically I was always left in the house on my own. Uh, and I remember just staring out the window at these kind of like the streets, the architecture that I saw. It was very liminal and the way it made me feel was curious yet scared. But um, I just came to do this project out of that and um, it actually helped me cope with that kind of feeling I had when I was younger. It was me confronting it and shaking it. But then obviously I wanted to move away from objects and, and wanted to go towards more people. Um, and this is the other part of the Blueprint project, which um, I started looking at artists that explored the snapshot genre in photography. Uh, so the likes of like um, Nan Golden and Richard Billingham um, were really heavy inspirations to me because it took the kind of family snapshot and it turned it on its head. It created a more kind of um, linguistic way of looking at how families work and how dynamics work socially. Um, and then I thought, well, how am I going to utilise this for my final major project? I was panicking, but then I worked in a chip shop for eight years. Um, and in those eight years, it kind of changed me as a person, how I interacted with the public. Um, and also opened my eyes to how close family can be, even though, the, even though they're not through blood. Um, so I started the shop. So I called it the shop because um, that's what everyone at, well, don't work there anymore, unfortunately. But on reflection, um, it's weird having this in future proof because I'm then looking at my past now, not the present. Um, but people call it the shop because um, like my boss, Paul, he's always called it the shop. Everyone that I work with, so you're working at the shop tonight, I would say, yeah. Um, but um, I wanted to kind of do the project based on what it was like to work there. Um, I chose to take the photos while I was on shift to kind of get that feeling of what it's like to work in there. Um, in reflection, when looking at them back and selecting them, it was the photos that looked like they were Russian. Everything was always a rush. Everything had a flow. Uh, some of them were well composed. Some of them weren't well composed. Um, obviously, some were for, were orchestrated, like the picture of Miguel, the boss's son. Uh, some were not, like obviously salt and vinegar on the chips. Um, but the project itself um, received a lot of positive positive feedback um, because um, it was showing what working class was like, what working class life is like, what is like. Um, and because I was in there as well, it got me to get a kind of a personal perspective of someone what it's like to work in there. Um, you know, and a lot of the pictures, they are mixed because sometimes the shifts did go quite well in the sense they were constructed um, and everything went well. But at the same time, you had days where it was bad and everything was all wishy-washy, everything was left all around and messy. Um, and obviously the project showed a lot of what you don't see when you go into these kind of places, takeaway places, the cleanup. Um, you know, um, and I also started to look at uh, in the project was more of a constructed portraiture uh, where I used a 645 camera to kind of capture, you know, these people's lives. Um, you know, Billy here, also known as Chalk, that's his nickname. Um, he was on a smoking break and he, he noticed I had my camera and he's saying, do you fancy taking my picture? I said, yeah, sure. Um, and I was talking to him and he was uh, saying how he loves the job. It's, it's actually the only job he's ever had was working in there with me. Um, and you, that isn't celebrated enough, I don't think, in, in, in Scottish culture particularly, as these kind of, what people would perceive to be mundane things. Um, but I like being involved with it, because I like to show it, I love to celebrate these stories, I like to celebrate these people, because um, they do help society turn in a way. Um, I, I know it's only a chip shop, but to a lot of people it's a second home. Like myself, it was a second home. Um, and then obviously I did experiment with some black and white as well. These were the only two that I did feature in the final major project that were black and white. Uh, these were taken in a more relaxed kind of um, environment where we were cleaning up. And obviously it kind of captured the kind of emotions and interactions, the banter that we all had in there. Because it is like having, you know, a different family, another family. Um, but after that, um, I kind of slowed down my photography for a bit. Um, but now I've started doing another project, which is based on um, the kind of 
the social structure of Dumfries and Galloway, but I'm not attributing it to the name. It could be any any small town in Scotland. Um, where I want to try and capture the kind of urban decay, um, the state of decay. Um, obviously, small Scottish towns don't get enough funding from the government, and um, that's reflected in a lot of the architecture that you do see around. Um, but that's that's my presentation, folks. Hope you enjoyed it, and thank you for listening. Over to you, Malcolm. Thank you very much, Rhys. We'll just go straight into the next one, if that's okay. okay. Hope everyone can see that. Um, so I'm just going to look to the left here as I read off my notes. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Karen. Um, I'm a recent graduate from the City of Glasgow College with a BA Honours in Photography. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about my degree show project, which was a crucial turning point in my understanding of photography and just my general love for it. Uh, so over the past few years, I'd say my practice has developed towards alternative processes and the expanded field. Um, and I've become increasingly interested in multidisciplinary techniques, um, as well as installation and the um, curation of photographic works. Um, so in many ways, I feel like I've only scratched the surface in terms of um, my own work and what I'm interested in. Um, but my degree project was the first step towards pursuing this approach um, in my photographic practice. So um, I'm just going to take you through my creative um, process and explain a wee bit about it. Uh, so Embryonic Journey is the title, um, this body of work, and it explores themes of fragility and vulnerability um, specific to my own journey with photography. Um, I'll admit I am a bit of a perfectionist, so that can be both good and bad. I'm sure a lot of people can resonate with that. Um, therefore, my aim at the beginning of this project was to produce a body of work which would challenge me um, as an artist and encourage me to create beyond a place of comfort and so-called perfection. Um, so to visualise this, I began working with the simple object of an egg, uh, looking to explore it as a physical object as well as a conceptual idea. I'm hoping that both of that would they would meet along the way. Um, in semiotic terms, the egg is a symbol of various things like religion, fertility, reincarnation. Um, but as the project went on, I found my own symbolism um, within the small object. So this image here is one of the very first pictures I took, which you'll soon realise is very different to my final um, piece. But I wanted to include it just to show a starting point and how the process evolved to become what it is now. Um, and it's that journey in between that's what essentially my project is all about, about the challenges of the creative process, the pressures, expectations that that brings, um, which I, for one, I definitely put pressure and um, pressure on myself and put my expectations up. So actually making this work helped me cope, uh, cope with and channel these feelings in a positive and creative way. Uh, so I photographed the egg in various different ways, getting to know it as an object, trying out lots of different techniques. Um, and as you can see here, I took, at first I took a kind of scientific approach, which was quite unusual for me actually. Um, I put the egg in vinegar, which um, causes the shell to erode, and this allows for a more intimate view of the egg, um, which you can see on the um, right hand side. Um, it's such a fascinating object that I wanted to go down all avenues in order to find um, a path to continue on, something that I was really interested in. So I went from the studio into the dark room and I began working with liquid emulsion. Um, and this is where my project really took off. Um, I was unfamiliar with liquid emulsion or liquid light, as a few people call it. Um, I hadn't used it before, but I love the idea of printing onto the egg itself and incorporating this kind of sculptural element um, going beyond the two-dimensional aspect of a physical print. Um, so it's here again that my interest peaked and I got hooked and then my project just developed from there. So just a quick bit about the actual process. Um, I used images which I'd shot on black and white film and projected them onto the inner shells, uh, the, the inside of the eggs. So this meant that firstly, I had to buy 
a lot of eggs, um, wash them out, coat them with the emulsion, allow them to dry off, um, being sure to get an even coating as well. Um, and then once they were dry, I projected the images on and developed them just using the standard darkroom process of developer stop bath fixer. Um, it sounds simple enough, but I actually I, I encountered a lot of mistakes and issues with the chemicals, um, especially the coating of the liquid emulsion. And at first I actually saw these mistakes as a setback. I was really frustrated um, when it didn't turn out the way I'd hoped. Um, with the image, you know, intact and fully visible. But, but these mistakes and blemishes and issues with the chemistry were something that I actually learned to embrace. And again, as I mentioned um, earlier, um, this kind of embracing vulnerability within my own creative process, um, that became the whole concept of my, my project. So just some close-ups of the eggs themselves. Um, the images inside the eggs are all different. Images I'd taken some specifically for the project, others which I had taken previously and wanted to use. Um, they include places that are meaningful to me, images of myself, images of friends, images of eggs inside of an egg. <laughs> um, but having special moments held within a fragile outer shell speaks a lot about who I am as a person. Um, and why it was crucial for me to make this work in order to understand that better and to share that with um, other people. Um, some of my favourite images are now actually the ones which didn't work out, ones where you can see slight discoloration from the chemicals or where the, the emulsion has pooled and bubbled. Um, and yeah, taking a step back from being in the process and being so close to it, and um, that has kind of taught me to appreciate um, the mistakes more and not see them as mistakes, but see them as kind of, um, yeah, happy accidents, which I can embrace and use to to better my practice and, um, yeah, to just become part of the whole project. So that's uh, just some more pictures you see the on the left hand side I think it is there one's really bubbled and pulled in the middle but I think that's um out of all of them that's probably my my favorite one um as much as I love the the purely sculptural element um of this project with just the eggs um I decided to go back into the studio and capture an image which again was symbolic of how I felt at the time um this might sound a wee bit crazy but um, I essentially identified with or became like the eggs that I was working with Um, there's a lot of puns that can go along with that but um, I was and still am at times just quite fragile myself um, who I'm a fragile shell who can um, very easily crack under pressure um, and this image here just highlights that but also shows that eggs are strong, um, I am strong, uh, you can place heavy objects on top and I might want to crumble but um, at the end of the day I can hold it together and can balance the weight of life's pressures um, better than I think. So this image really speaks a lot into that um, as much as it was quite a difficult image to set up and um, there's a lot of uh, underlying meaning and context um, behind it and um, I just wanted to, to show that in quite a strong um, striking image and um, these images are just from my um, degree show so I had a bit of a smaller space to work with but that was also quite challenging and interesting to really think about the layout and how I wanted um, especially the shells how I wanted them to to be placed and to to be interpreted um, I'll just say I, I learned a lot about myself in this process and where I'd like to be in the future. Um, I definitely want to keep making work like this, um, where I'm taking the notion of photography and extracting the emotion um, and then recreating something which is unique and significant. So I, I loved working with alternative processes and would relish like the opportunity to to get back into that and um, to get back into the dark room and create more 
and to create more eggs <laughs> um, to refine my technique and just continue learning. Um, at the moment, I'm taking a bit of a break from photography and would really hope to become more involved with kind of exhibition curational side of things. Um, something again, which I discovered um, a real passion for uh, in my final year. Um, I'm interested in installation. If I was to expand this project and continue it, I'd like to consider the installation and the presentation of this work a bit more um, deeply and how these elements complement the overall concept. I um, think photography is such a diverse medium and it holds so many possibilities, which I'm excited to explore um, as I hopefully pursue a career in the industry. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Lovely presentation. Uh, I like your reference to happy accidents. It's a very important uh, aspect of the creative process. Um, but there's something in there about the materiality of uh, of photography, uh, which is quite fascinating. So when you do come back to photography, remember street levels, dark rooms. So I will. <laughs> hope we'll see you in the future there. So uh, Nicolene. Yes, yeah, so I'm Nicolene. I'm a Danish photographer living in Copenhagen, and I studied at Glasgow School of Art. And my interest in photography lies in the landscape, and it revolves around the environment and the environmental crisis that we are in. So for my degree show project, uh, I went to Iceland, and the project is called Faljuku, the Falling Glacier. And these are the two pieces that you're able to see in street level and here is a bit of an installation view from my degree show and for me it's um the project is about the fastest melting glacier outlet uh, from europe's largest glacier and it's a landscape that is constantly changing from the consequences of humanity and the landscape that might disappear in my lifetime so by going here, I wanted to start creating this archive of photographs from the glacier. Um, we went on to this glacier for five hours and we saw such a small um, part of it. But in that short distance, we also saw such a huge difference in the ice from everything from the color to the shapes of how it's melting. And um, even these bigger, um, mountains with a lot of volcanic rocks and in the degree show I wanted to incorporate as many photographs as possible for the viewer to be able to step into a room and experience maybe being there uh, so for me in my practice it's also quite important to try and find the best possible way to show the photographs so anything from frame photographs to mounted or light boxes or something showing on the floor. Um, so here I've created three triptychs of light boxes with the natural elements of Iceland, um, starting with the basaltic rocks and the glacial ice and then the geothermal mud. And on the floor here you have two channel types that are uh, weather imprints. So it's a new experimentation for me where I wanted to start creating images with the weather. So one is rain and the other one is melting ice. And it's quite interesting because you don't really know what's going to happen to the paper or how the forms are going to shape. And I think that's also the element that I like of it. And there's another close up of the light boxes. And for the light boxes, I, I wanted to try and make the image become more alive. So with the light shining from behind, it enhanced the colors, but it also in these enhanced the contrast and the ice looked more like alive and actually looked like it was melting. Um, so I quite like that you could experiment, but also make this a bit more tangible to look at. Um, and that's also a thing that I want to do with my photography is make these talking about 
subjects of envi environmental crisis is to make it more tangible for people to understand, but also to highlight some of the things that might not be as present in the news and try and see what time does to a landscape. Um, whilst making the work for Iceland, I these kind of came into the picture, which is something I started making during COVID uh, with no facilities. And I thought that these could kind of resemble the volcanic rock and like make small imprints onto paper as we couldn't bring back the volcanic rocks to Glasgow. And so this is another element of the nature coming into the space. And here is another picture of the scattered wall is again also this diversity of showing something very bright in the blue ice with the very contrasty volcanic rock that's present in the landscape. Um, and it was just really interesting to see how, for example, the one in the middle is, it's actually the end of a glacier, because when the glacier melts, it pushes all this stone up from the ground. And um, it was really great to also be able to, because here, this um, Falyukul, the Falling Glacier, is the name of the outlet. It's actually also where the British Geology Research Centre has their research station. So I could go back and see all this data that they have collected through the years. And also to learn more about the, the, the melt of the glacier and all these more scientifically um, aspects of it. And so, yeah, I wish to go back to to keep documenting the glacier outlets and collectively make this archive where you see the change of, of the land uh, and what time does. But yeah, for now, I'm, uh, I'm working here in Copenhagen in a print studio uh, where I'm the mounter, so I'm mountain cut prints. And when I'm not working, I'm developing my practice. And uh, for now, I'm I'm making quite a lot of the chemigrams. Um, so these ones is uh, what my facilities can uh, do right now. But yeah, I hope to to go on and, and make some more projects and and research new locations. Um, and then yeah, maybe in the future uh, a master could be something to to look at. Um, and 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 maybe go abroad again uh, to do this. Yes, Denmark doesn't really have one that I find interesting at the moment. Um, so even Iceland would be amazing to go back to and actually study there and, and have the time with the landscape uh, even more. So, but yeah, I think, I think that's me. And uh, thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, put them in the chat or you're also welcome to, to contact me. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolene, uh, and for joining us uh, this evening. Now, um, I seriously hope that you will continue with your practice, so you have to find a way to do that. As I said at the, at the beginning, that, um, what you see in degree shows is really just a taste of what is about to come, and uh, stick with it and find, find a way yeah. to <laughs> Thank, so thank you. you. Thank you. Thank so, you. Uh, last Hello. presentation of uh, of this evening is uh, with Hanin. So, Hanin, if you would like to uh, join us and uh, share your presentation, thank you. I hope everyone can see that okay. Yeah, um, that's good, Hanin. My name is Hanin Hadi. I am a recent graduate from the Glasgow School of Art, studied fine art photography. Um, my practice in the recent years has really just been focusing on this deep grown connection that I have towards um, the Iraqi date palms. For those who don't know, uh, Iraq is the cradle of civilization, where the palm trees um, are known to have nurtured civilization. Um, These are a selection of photographs from my degree show um, titled The Mother of the Motherland, which explores this deep grown connection. Um, I kind of like to word the act of 
or my form of art making as an act of devotion towards these palms. Um, the palm, the date palms are responsible for the growth of human population. Um, and the first palm tree to have ever been discovered was in the land of Mesopotamia. Um, so what kind of interested me to focus on the effect that climate change has had on these date palms in the recent years was an awareness to um, realizing that the population of these palms are decreasing. And I kind of felt like at one point when I was present within the land, I felt like if these palms were to disappear, then I will soon disappear. Um, it kind of gives you an insight to how connected I am to them. So I traveled to Iraq specifically to document for Degree Show. And it was a moment of being present within the land temporarily. Um, I'll go on to talk about that um, in a bit, but that kind of stuck with me um, post-documentation. Uh, I kind of felt guilty that I was traveling to be present within the land of the palms just to document and then detach from them. So what interested me was this grown connection that had been happening whilst being separated from them um, and I'm still trying to figure out where this connection is coming from uh, but I continue to explore my practice using any elements um, that are within the date pans. Uh, this year I got to exhibit, I got to set up a solo exhibition at Iota Gallery in Glasgow um, and I exhibited paintings I should have mentioned that my practice is very multi-medium. I work with a variety of different mediums exploring the same symbol. Um, so yeah, these paintings were all made using dried palm tree fronds. So I made paintbrushes out of the fronds. Um, and what became interesting throughout this specific practice was I began to focus on the connection between the movement of my hands and the movement of uh, the fronds. And yeah, these, these paintings were, were formed and exhibited in Glasgow. Post-graduation, I got the opportunity to, well, I was funded by Creative Scotland um, and got given an incredible opportunity uh, to work on a self-directed residency in Iraq, a four-month self-directed residency, uh, exploring this, the awareness of being temp temporarily within the land and seeing how that would affect my practice and the, this connection. Um, I wanted to discover where the connection's coming from, why I'm obsessed with the palm trees, uh, why I see them as human figures. So I'm currently working on a project with Khalid Tawfiq, who is an Iraqi visual artist. Um, and we're working on a project that we titled The Language of the Palms. And basically what this practice is exploring is the the way the palm trees communicate to us, to human beings. Um, and I want to be able to give the palms a voice um, to express themselves through the form of art making. Uh, we're focusing on three different mediums. And we're working with three different mediums, uh, photography, moving imagery. We're going to be creating a short film in the form of visual poetry and um, drawings. So these are my recent drawings um, from Project The Language of the Palms. And yeah, that's me.
Thank you, Hanin. Uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating work. Uh, it's one of the things about photography uh, and its storytelling capabilities is uh, making you look at something that you were previously unaware of, as I was, about the significance of date palms which in a way you kind of, um, you kind of see them as a, a barometer, yeah, of, of, of climate change and, and much more. So if, um, would everyone else like to uh, come back on screen now? And um, if there's anything you would like to ask of, of, uh, of one another at this stage, uh, Susan has had to leave us, uh, uh, a family uh, emergency. Uh, but before she left, uh, she's put a question uh, which is directed at Karen. And it's a technical question uh, about how long it took you to complete the egg image printing inside the egg from start to finish. Yeah, um, surprisingly quick. It's really just like the kind of printing on... Um, photographic paper. Um, the emulsion, uh, it actually, I just had to expose it for not, not even seconds, milliseconds. Um, it was a very short amount of time for the image to, to take onto the shell. And uh, yeah, it was, I guess when you've got about 100 eggs to do, it can take quite a while, but individually it's, um, it was, yeah, it was, um, a, a good process, though. Enjoy. And and now that you have all uh, left the institutions that you were connected to, um, do you see any difficulties in continuing your practice in terms of being able to to produce? Is, has that arisen yet, or is that a barrier that maybe is to come? Like, how will you how will you make work now? That's really a question to all of you. If we could go go round you. Uh, you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I think it's definitely challenging. Uh, I I believe that there. I mean, in my case, there is like a, a lack of motivation. I think because uh, you're so focused before you graduate, you're so focused in making work and preparing for a degree show. So you're like well on the ball and then post-graduation um, or post-degree show you just kind of want to settle or take time to relax um, and that can be dangerous as an artist uh, taking advantage of that but I think just realizing I mean if you're obsessed with your practice then there's no such thing as um, failing or taking a, a large break um, just yeah motivate yourself constantly Anyone else like to contribute? Yeah, I can I can totally agree with Anine. I think what happens is you don't realize when it's in that final year, especially I can speak from a GSA context of the amount of pressure and stress which is on you to get to your degree show. And you actually come out of it a little bit burned out. I think all of us did. And then you have to realize at some point you have to pick yourself back up from that. You know, I think that's the hard thing. You need to give you, you need, I found it hard at the beginning to give myself a break. But actually, then I realized I needed to take it. And then it's the process of just getting, making sure you keep your practice going. You know, even if you're not doing as much as you were, just continually making sure you're still shooting stuff, trying to be around people who are also making stuff and keeping those connections. Because I think that's the thing you lose quite quickly is that community that you had built up around you. I think the important thing is to try and either keep that as much as you can or try and rebuild it as you know as you can wherever you are because that's really important because I've found that being around other photographers has helped me a lot to keep you know to talk about stuff and to keep me involved and to actually just understand how hard and long the process you know it's a career it's a life it's not something that's going to happen overnight and talking to other photographers who are 10 years in or maybe even just a few years out of art school is really good getting their perspective because it helped me a lot to deal with coming out and just trying to be a photographer myself okay yeah, I completely agree. Like it's 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 also like, well, I'm I'm working full time, so like finding the time to then go on to be a member in a in the dark room to then continue the practice. Um, 
can be quite hard, but especially that community that you'd built up was is so important uh, for the motivation as well, because you're just constantly in it and thinking about it or like someone would make a comment about uh, something and, and that would just roll the ball of of the work maybe. Um, so yeah, I think that the, the art school life was definitely a huge motivation. Um, and yeah, to keep that is, is really important. Uh, Nicolene uh, Ross Finney has uh, posted uh, a question uh, which follows on from something that Hanin said about measures of climate change. Uh, do you have any plans to revisit the glaciers in Iceland? I think you maybe referenced that, a desire to do so. Definitely. Um, uh, I, I don't, sorry? He says he had a pretty depressing experience revisiting uh, some glaciers in New Zealand after mm. years. Yeah, yeah. So no, I definitely want to go back. And um, a huge inspiration is uh, Olaf Eliasson, and he's also done some work on the glaciers. And he couldn't believe when he went back 20 years after his first uh, documentation. Uh, so yeah, I definitely want to go back within a couple of years just to see the change that's happened in, in such a small um time frame i'm actually applying for a, a residency up there um which would happen this summer so <laughs> hoping to get that uh, it would be fun to go there i was there during the winter time so it would also be interesting to see just the change in, in winter and summer uh so yeah definitely planning to go back if if not uh, the next year then hopefully within the next five years to come yeah. You get anything to add, Rhys? I know that you've been uh, getting back into the dark room recently, so uh, anything you'd like to add here? I think, <clears throat> sorry, one of the most important things for me um, being in an educational environment was actually the crit, the crit sessions um, because they were able to kind of steer me into a direction that I thought I wouldn't want to go in, but when hearing feedback from other people, um, it really helped. Uh, and the darkroom side as well, I have been getting more into the darkroom at street level, um, which is really good. And and obviously it's places like these that give you that sense of community that that, that you get the same at um, at university. Um, only at, at these other places, it's more open. Um, you meet so many different people and so many different age groups as well. Um, and all everyone is on the same boat in the sense that we're still trying to make projects, we're still trying to engage audiences. Uh, we're still trying to find new ways of looking at things as well. Um, but I, to be honest, it has been hard since leaving university. Um, and I have been in that kind of production hell of not doing anything for a while. But it's only in the last few months, a couple of months, I've started to go out and take, take more pictures and then look at them and then kind of like, you know, create a story from them almost. Um, so, yeah, it's lucky to have these institutions about that, that still um, encourage creativity. Yeah, there are other independent initiatives as well, but uh, just to fly the flag there, uh, the two photography centres, Stills in Edinburgh and Street Level in Glasgow are very good resources for um, practitioners who are in the central belt. Uh, and you've all kind of said this, the importance of peer support. I think that's really quite critical. It hasn't been long since she's left uh, the institution, so uh, I don't think you should feel uh, rushed or pressured or anxious about that, uh, but find, a, uh, find other ways of reconnecting. Um, keep an eye out for uh, events that uh, may be happening at Stills that brings people together, uh, but also the round table uh, sessions that do happen uh, through street level where you can share work in progress uh, in that supportive environment where you're not being judged uh, but it's good to get feedback through that also the format uh, supported bursaries uh, through stills and street level are currently available uh, at the moment and that will support uh, 10 practitioners uh, in Scotland to be able to attend 
the online portfolio reviews at the Format International Festival. That's a good platform to get feedback on your work from other uh, professionals. So a few plugs there. There's a few comments uh, which are all complimentary, no direct questions. Uh, Northeast College of Photography in Aberdeen, very informative. Great to see an array of approaches from everyone's practice. Uh, similarly echoed by uh, Robert Henderson, uh, practices and obsessions. Uh, wonderful to hear, well done. Thank you. Um, David Dickey, he will be down to the Harbour Arts Centre this weekend uh, to see the exhibition himself. So good on you, David. Do you have any questions to one another before we before we wrap up? No. Yeah, I have a small one actually for Reese. Interestingly, um, I was interested because it's something that I find in my work as well. Is um, what do you think about the idea that people find your work mundane or they find a mundanity in it? Because I actually think it can be some of the most interesting thing in people's work because actually a lot of life is mundane, you know, and I think my work has that in it as well. A lot of it is about that mundanity, about the nothing is really happening at that moment or that people are somehow bored. It's not boredom, but I find that quite interesting. Um, a lot of my inspirations does come from the mundane because um, I looked at a lot of Stephen Gill's work where he photographed a lot of really mundane things like the back of billboard signs and, um, you know, people on the train and, you know, even pigeons under these bridges in London, which I thought was a bit strange. But it goes back down to that idea of, like, um, when you have a camera, this is just from my experience, it's capturing the way you perceive the world. And obviously, if you take one picture, say, of, I don't know, like a traffic cone, like stuck down a drain or something, um, so well, that's just a traffic cone down a drain. But then if you go out and photograph loads of that, like loads of traffic cones down drains, and it creates a story or like a, like a study of behaviour. Um, no, but I do think, um, like I've had that kind of thing about my work before, about thinking, oh, this is just getting a little bit, you know, samey. But um, it's how I perceive the world. And, and obviously everyone perceives the world differently. Uh, and it's celebrating that mundaneness because life is mundane. Every single aspect of life is mundane, you know. Um, I hope that kind of answered your question, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it's joyous as well, Reese. right? It's mundane, but can be joyous. Uh, but there's lots of challenges ahead, uh, shall we say, in the current environment. So I think uh, resilience is the way forward and uh, creativity is the driver uh, for that. I'm going to ask you all an unfair question, you know, there was one one name, person, a cultural figure, photographer or whatever that you would hold up who has influenced your practice, who would it be? Start with you, Karen. Oh, put on the spot. Um, I actually looked a lot at, not totally similar to my practice, but um, Wolfgang Tillmans. Um, I just really love their um approach and especially when it comes to um the you know presentation and kind of curation of their work i just think that it it flows the whole narrative flows from you know the point of making to the, the very point of showing it and having it placed at a specific part on the wall i just yeah i really really love wolfgang tillman's work well that's good nico can just be a name um, I think it would be Sebastio Salgado. Um, his work is incredible. Okay, Hanin. Put in the shot for me. Okay. Nice, nice. Reese. There's loads, but uh, if I was to pick one, it probably be Nan Golden. Uh. Nan Golden's work so always stuck with me because obviously, obviously in my personal life it's relatable um, yeah and it's just a good way of storytelling good Alan it's an impossible question to answer really like I want to say 20 names but I think uh, I'm, I'm between two and I'm trying to decide you know uh, is that... yeah okay I'll probably say I'd say maybe Walker Evans 
because I absolutely love that American style of black and white photography. There's three other names on my tongue, but I'll I'll stick with that. That's you know, there's you know, Robert Graham. I'd like to say I have to say the both. I can't I can't help myself. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot. I know she name dropped uh, Stephen Willats earlier as well. Yeah, I, I very much love love his work and yeah. So.